Thank you, musicians and workers. I appreciate your help. Turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 3, where we're going to look at the Word of God together. In September 28 and 1781, uh, the British were, they had a fort at Yorktown. American and French forces marched and reached Yorktown, and they began digging trenches. And the idea of digging trenches is they wanted to trap the British and be able to bring artillery close enough to inflict damage. They did this, they actually dug several lines of trenches. And then uh, after three weeks, you know that uh, uh, the troops were able to defeat the British and they had to surrender. I use that story from history because Digging ditches was the key to victory. In the story that we're going to read, that is exactly what happens. There are people who are in great trouble. They need God to do a miracle, and God's word to them is dig some ditches. I want to preach uh, a message that I've entitled Dominion Rules because the point of these ditches is God is showing them the pattern of victory and dominion in your life, but you have to follow God's rules, hence the title, Dominion Rules. Let's read 2 Kings 3, starting at verse 16. He said, this is what the Lord says, make this valley full of ditches. For this is what the Lord says, you will uh, see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley shall be filled with water, and you and your cattle other animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. He will also hand Moab over to you. You will overthrow every fortified city and major town. You will cut down every good tree, stop up all the sp springs, ruin every good field with stones. The next morning about the time for the offering of the sacrifice, there it was, water flowing from the direction of Edom and the land was filled with water, dominion rules. Let's begin, I wanna talk about digging ditches. The story, I only read just one portion of it. You have to read uh, all of uh, chapter three because it gives a visible lesson in the power of obedience. The story that you're gonna find in 2 Kings 3 is a story that shows when you disobey God, things don't go well. A man named Joram, he becomes king over Israel, but he is disobedient. He will not do what God says. 2 Kings 3.3, 3, he continued to sin like Jeroboam's sin, and he did not stop doing the same sin. So he doesn't want to do, he's supposed to belong to God, but he doesn't want to do what God says. And the story says when you don't want to do what God says, don't be surprised when trouble comes. What's going on is the king of Moab rebels against his rule, causes him trouble. He asks another king named Jehoshaphat to join him in battle to fight Moab. Jehoshaphat agrees to help a disobedient man. So now Jehoshaphat is disobedient. How many of you know you're not supposed to help people sin? Right? You shouldn't help people rob banks, deal drugs, anything else, right? This is kind of common sense. So now you have these kings, and then they add in another king uh, that is uh, uh, not one of the children of God. Three kings, they march through the desert seven days with no water. So just before the verses that we read, now there is terrible thirst. All of the animals are going to die, and now the men are facing death. So the story is told so that we always remember, don't be surprised if trouble comes into your life when you are living in disobedience. In the garden from the very beginning, we know this is true. God said, when you disobey, you will have trouble. Now, sweat and toil and thorns, resistance and pain and trouble. 
the book of Judges, the repeated uh, pattern is God's people disobey. And when they disobey, God allowed enemies to come and to conquer them. And this happened again and again. Judges 6 verse 1, then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. We talked in our series on kingdom prosperity. When, you diso when you're disobedient financially, don't be surprised when your finances don't go well because that's how God uh, uh, made life. Uh, when you date an unbeliever, don't be surprised that the child of hell starts acting like hell. That is what happens. So this doesn't have to be blatant sin. I'm not talking about you're out dealing drugs, you're, you know, hitman for the mafia. You don't have to do that. God has spoken things for our lives. He wants us to obey. And when we disobey, he allows trouble to show us we are not God. We need to listen to God. And the point is, we need to obey. So now we're getting to the, the, the passage that we started reading on into the story. Three kings, when faced with trouble, they realize this isn't working well. Now we want to change. We want God's help. That's a good thing. That is why God allows trouble for disobedience is so you get to the point where you say, this isn't working well. I shouldn't live like this. And that is what's happening in this story. So when they send for the prophet Elisha, they say, we need God's help. We've blown it. We shouldn't have been doing this. Now would you pray for God to help us? And so the prophet speaks. He is not willing to just simply say a prayer Oh, God, fix all of their problems. The path of victory is always the path of obedience. If how you get into trouble is by disobedience, you're not going to fix your trouble unless you're willing to be obedient. And that is the message that Elisha gives them. In every place in life that we have a miracle need in miracles there's always an instruction verse 16 this is the word from of God through the prophet thus says the Lord make this valley full of ditches dig some ditches in other words God has something he wants you to do that demonstrates obedience he tells the fishermen when they needed a miracle in their job, let down your nets or another time, cast your nets on the other side. An instruction, the widow of Zarephath, give to the Lord first. To a man named Naaman who wants to be healed of leprosy, go and wash, dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River and then God will heal you. Instructions, God could do miracles without it, but he is making a point. Remember the first point? Disobedience brings trouble obedience brings God's help. John 2, verse 5, Mary said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And then verse 7 and 8, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. Some of you in your life right now, you have great needs and you're praying God fix the problem give me what I need you probably would be wise to ask God is there something you want me to do that is an attitude of surrender an attitude of obedience now God doesn't have to give you an instruction every single time but my point is you are 
saying to God, I am willing. Is there something you want me to do in life? Psalm 123, verse 2, as the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their masters, so that as the eyes of a maid looks to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he shows us mercy. Now, we don't have slaves these days, thank God, but this is talking about someone. If you've ever been in a, uh, a restaurant with outstanding service, that doesn't happen often these days. It's like, hello, hello, the, the waiters and waiters disappear for hours. But if you've ever been in a very good restaurant with outstanding service, you know that they are attentive. That's what this text is saying. What do you need I took Lisa to a, for an anniversary, I can't remember, 30, 35 year anniversary, whatever it was, to a nice restaurant. And I'm telling you that everything, when your drink got slightly, they were there. You drop something on the floor. They, I, I almost wanted to drop things just to see if they, like, whoa, look at that. They were attentive. That's what this text is saying, is when you're serving God, God, I am awaiting your instructions. And so the instruction given to them is dig ditches. God obviously could do the miracle without ditches, but the point is the path of obedience is the path to miracle power. And in our text, he doesn't just say dig one ditch. He says keep digging, verse 16, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. You know why God says that? Because he knows human nature. Often they approach things like, okay, God wants me to do something. Yeah, I did that once and it didn't work out. So therefore, they're giving up on it. In this text, Elisha is telling them, keep digging. The Bible says that in another place, it a king came, he needed a miracle of victory over the enemy that had been tormenting them. The Syrians for years had been attacking. And so uh, the man of God says, take a bow and arrow and shoot. This is a picture of you winning a victory. And he only shot three arrows. The man of God was angry. He had a quiver full of arrows. In other words... You are giving bare minimum, but what you want from God is absolute maximum. Doesn't work that way. You need to keep digging so that God is able to help you. When Lisa and I first went in the ministry in a, in a place called Launceston, the island of Tasmania in Australia, God helped us from the beginning. We had converts immediately when we went there the church was growing, good things were happening. We went through a, a dry spell where people were not getting saved. Like, I think if I remember right, it was for three months. It was like something dried up. And so I began going out and witnessing every day at lunch. There's a small town, but people would gather at lunch. And I started going out every day. And this went on and on and on. I didn't just do this one time. We had regular times of outreaches, but just on my own, I said, I want a breakthrough. And I didn't just witness once and then say, I tried that. I kept going on and kept going on. What was interesting is on the outreaches, nothing seemed to be happening. But while I was going out, then people started coming and getting saved it was as though God was seeing whether I was committed to a pattern of obedience. Let's talk secondly about another place. In this text, it emphasizes that they will not be able to see or measure God's working. Verse 17, you shall not see wind or rain, and yet the valley shall be filled with water. This is so interesting. They need water. The most common way that you're going to get water in the desert is if it rains. He says you're not going to see the rain. You know here in the monsoon season what happens just before the thunderstorm. The, the wind comes in. God says you're not going to see the wind. 
You're not going to be able to see rain. And yet, a miracle of water is going to occur. In other words, God is saying, sometimes I don't want you to be able to say, oh, there it is, there it is. There, I know it's getting close because God is saying, I'm not limited. My miracle power is not limited to what you can see or measure. He knows human nature. We base our faith and confidence often on what we see. We have unsaved family members or, or friends we're witnessing to them. And what we're looking for is tears in the eyes as we're talking to them. They're like, <laughs> teary, like, oh, they're getting close. Or we, when we don't get that kind of reaction, People tell us where to go and it's not the potter's house. Then we assume they're not close to getting saved at all. Or in finances, I've been challenging you to ask and believe God for miracles. And so it, you're, you're, it, right, long about that time, the boss sends a memo, no raises. It's, oh man, it's, it's far away. It, it can't happen. In this text, it specifically says... The water came from Edom. Verse 20, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. They are in the valley. Edom was quite some distance away. It was raining, apparently, in the mountains of Edom where they could not see it. And yet the water made its way to where they were at. Here's the lesson that God is telling us out of this. There are things happening in other places that can change your life. Some of the things that will change your life are not what, oh, there it is. You can't see it at all, and yet God is doing Miracles. The rain was beginning, but they couldn't hear it. The rain was beginning someplace else. They couldn't see it, but it was happening. In other words, God is telling us, don't judge. Don't base your faith on what you're seeing on their face or in your circumstances because that is not an accurate indication Jesus is walking with the disciples. He sees a fig tree and he curses it. This is a visible lesson. He says, no one will ever eat from you. In other words, this tree is going to die. And apparently they all looked at the tree, still had green leaves. Apparently it didn't work. They go away and the next day when they come up, the Bible says it was dried up, dead from the roots. And Peter is shocked. He's like, Lord, the tree that you cursed, it's dead. Do you know what? It was dead the moment Jesus said it. But the point was, Peter couldn't see it. Because I look at the leaf and right now it still looks green. I assume God's doing nothing. That is not true. Daniel 10, verse 12, the man said to me, Daniel, don't be afraid. Some time ago, you decided to get understanding and humble yourself before your God. Since that time, God has listened to you, and I have come because of your prayers. Listen, God can be working on people for salvation. Some of the very people who they told you where to go yesterday, but God could be preparing them for salvation today. You know, the night that I got saved, I had no intention of getting saved. I actually ditched the concert, and Dad and I had a meeting that was much more painful for me than it was for him. And so I came into the concert, I had a foul mouth, and I was mad, and I was embarrassed, and so I was cussing. 
Uh, under my breath, I'm thinking this blankety blank and that and that is schmeckum breckum. It was not good, and the altar calls going on. I am not going to get saved. This is not what I want. But during the altar call, I, I started thinking about all the trouble that I'm in, and uh, I lifted my hand. And by the time that I went to the altar, I genuinely meant it. If you would have looked at me 20 minutes before, you would have assumed he's not close to getting saved. But that's the point here, is it's not based on what you can see. I have seen this. I've seen pastors and pastors' wives that are discouraged, ready to quit, and then in one service, someone gets saved. They're a key person that brings entire families or classes or teams or, or uh, uh, workmates. Elijah had been praying for rain six times. Nothing, nothing, nothing each time. But the seventh time, the servant came back and he said, well, there's a little cloud. It's kind of the size of a man's hand. Elijah said, we better run because the rain is coming. In another place. See, what you, not only can your life be affected by things that are happening in another place, what you do here can make a difference in victory in another place. When you pray, never underestimate the power of praying for people in another place. You have no idea how profound that is. A man named Lester Summerall, a famous Pentecostal preacher, but he has uh, now long since passed away. He was on a missionary trip in, in China and Tibet. They're riding donkeys up in the mountains of Tibet. He got dysentery. He got so sick... He was the last one in the line, got so sick he couldn't carry on, fell off of the mule and uh, laid by the side of the road. He was dying. And all of a sudden, he said, after laying there for a couple of hours, he said, something happened on the inside and strength came into his body. He felt good got up on the mule and wound up catching up with the, with the others. He went home to the United, United States and he was telling this, he was preaching, telling the story of Jesus touching him while he's in the mountains of Tibet. After service, a woman came and asked him, when was that? And he had marked it down, knew the exact day. They worked out the time difference. A lady said, she showed a diary that she carried with her she said, I was praying and God spoke to me and said, pray for Lester Summerall right now. He needs help. This is in the United States. In Tibet, all of a sudden strength came in. In another place, you are affected by good things happening in another place, but what you do here affects. Giving does that. We give here. Every service we have offerings. We use them for various things. One of the things that we do is we, we help support and pay for the Miracle Healing Crusade in, in San Luis. This year when I preached that, a, a mother brought a, a girl there that uh, she was deaf. And in the crusade, the girl got healed the next night the mother came and the entire service she sat there with a phone. She was live streaming or FaceTiming, whatever app she was using. She was videoing and sending it live to her brother in another city in Mexico that he had been injured and was in pain and couldn't move. And while we're praying in San Luis, Mexico, somewhere else, her brother got healed watching on her phone. And that was made possible because we gave in Pre we gave in Prescott, sent money to San Luis, and in another city, God is doing a miracle. You witness, and in another city, uh, uh, someone is impacted. We've been doing Celebrate America for how many years now, Louis? Forty-one. 
42. You got to shout, I can't. Oh, 26, okay. So for, for years we, we did this and, and you know, we get people saved and, and uh, would, would not see fruit from that. A few years ago, a man came up and he told, uh, if I remember, he told Louis that he was one of those that would come up from Phoenix to party on the 4th of July and he came up ready to party on the whiskey row, heard the preaching of the gospel at our God and Country celebration and he said, I got saved. I'm living for Jesus down in Phoenix. Uh, in another place. Amen. Thank God. Let's talk finally about defeating the enemy. In the story that I'm telling you about, the kings and the armies had a need. Their need, according to them, is we just want water. Verse 9, after they marched seven days, there was no more water for the army or their animals that were with them. All they wanted in their mind, this is it, if we could just have some water, we would be happy. Just, just give us a drink. That's all we want. But God has something bigger in mind. Listen, when he does a miracle, I don't know what your need is. Do you need financial help? Is it a miracle of healing? Is it the salvation of a loved one? In your mind, you're thinking, if I could just have that happen, that's all I need. But God has something bigger in mind. Because God says, remember the text we just read? God said, that's easy. That's easy. That's not a problem. Water is no sweat. But God said... Water is not all I want to do. What I want to do is I do want to give you water, but I want to defeat the enemy. And now we come to the strange instruction, dig ditches. And he said, fill the valley. Make the entire valley full of ditches. Don't you know there were some people while they're digging going, this is stupid. Why are we digging ditches? There's no water. We're not digging a well. We're digging ditches. Why do we do it? A ditch means water. We got no water. Right? Some of you, that would be you. <laughs> and we duct tape your mouth. Like, we don't want you to kill our miracle. Just keep your mouth shut. Just keep digging. And then the point of the ditches, the water in another place now flows Every ditch now is filled with water. The enemy is looking down at, at these armies that they want to kill. And in the morning, the sun is reflecting on the water. And they said, I think it's blood. They must have been fighting and killed each other. Look at that. The valley is filled with blood. And so they come down all happy. They said, let's go take all their money. <laughs> they go, we going to get some money. And they're waiting for them. And when the enemy armies came, they were able to defeat them. Listen, the point of God doing a miracle for you is not just to give you a miracle. It is to give you dominion. It is so that you rule. That is the point, the name of the sermon, dominion rules. God is wanting you to determine what happens. Circumstances, for some of you, determine what happens right now. The devil determines what happens in some way. But God wants you to have dominion, which is the right to rule, you determine what happens, and that is according to God's will. Deuteronomy 28, uh, 13, the Lord will make you to be like the head and not the tail. The head determines where the tail goes. Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Jesus said, Satan lost ground. He lost territory today. Why? Because they saw some miracles of healing. They cast out some demons. You know what you need? There, there are 
Couples that are here, you feel the call of God on your life. You want to preach the gospel. Oh, how you need a supernatural dimension in your life. You want to preach the gospel. Preaching the gospel, pioneering a church, doing the will, it's the most exciting, it's the most rewarding thing you'll ever do. But I want to be honest with you, it's the most frustrating, it's the hardest thing you'll ever do. You have no idea some of you here, you're here with all your brothers and sisters. You go, it's like really hard. Oh, listen, wait till you're on your own. There's demons in there. Exactly, and that's why we sent you. That is, that is often the letter. I get I, these pastors, we send them out. You see them on the screen. I've had calls from numbers of them. Once they got there, they're like, man, this city's like really hard. Things are expensive. The devils are big. And my response is, and that's why we sent you there. You need to change that. So what you have to have, you don't need techniques. You need supernatural power. The words that are used in the Bible is kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, that's conflict. Matthew 12, 28, if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God will come unto you. Listen to me. If you can't overcome the enemy now, when you have hundreds of your fellow believers with you, you will be very unlikely to overcome the enemy later when you're on your own. You must have an area. I've had this, I want to preach. Can I be sent out this time? Where in your life is evidence of dominion. Where in your life have you changed? You were in poverty and you changed it. There was sickness and you changed it. There was barrenness and you changed it because you need dominion. That is why it is not God's job to protect you from every problem. Problems actually help you because they teach you, first of all, whether you have dominion or not. I am powerful. I am spiritual. Oh my God, the devil's after me. You're not as powerful as you thought, were you? That's good. That's a lesson. But it's training ground so that you learn how to fight and establish dominion. There's a principle that I, I teach. And that principle is that breakthroughs are transferable. David came up and he saw a giant who is defying God's people and threatening them and intimidating them. And he said, someone needs to fight him. He goes, I'm going to fight him. And they took him aside. You're, you're just a boy. How can you, what makes you think you can fight a giant? And David said something profound. He said, because I fought a lion and I fought a bear. So I fought a lion and God helped me. I fought a bear and God helped me. But he understood this. If God helped me with the lion, if God helped me with the bear, no, I've never fought a giant before, but breakthroughs are transferable. Why would God help me with the lion and the bear and not help me with the giant? No, it is to build my faith I got a breakthrough with the lion. I got a breakthrough with the bear. Today I'm going to get a breakthrough and take dominion over the giant. You see, to God, he doesn't care what your miracle need is. Like God doesn't have big and little. Like, okay, money, that's no problem. Salvation of your backslidden child. Oh my God, what am I going to do? That's hard. That's not how God looks at it. It all takes a miracle. So if you can get a miracle in any area, the point you could transfer that by faith and say, God, I am believing you in this area. Verse 24, it gives the whole point of the story. When the Moabites came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites came out and fought them until they ran away. Then the Israelites went on into the land and they killed the Moabites, listen, you need to contend for a supernatural dimension because whenever I see people 
that they get a breakthrough in one area, I know that more breakthroughs are soon to follow because breakthroughs are transferable. I close with this story. A man named Bruce Van Natta, he said in 2006, he was working, he was a mechanic. A Peterbilt logging truck fell off a jack while he was working underneath it. How many of you know it's not good when a semi loaded with logs falls on top of you? And so here is, a, uh, he said that this fell on him, the axle fell on his chest, crushing his, uh, uh, his midsection. He said his midsection was only a couple of inches tall after being crushed. He said that uh, veins and arteries below the heart were severed, internal organs were damaged. This massive weight being on, one of the things it did is it absolutely crushed his small intestine. He said after, he had to have four operations, and after four operations, his small intestine was less than four inches long. That was all that they could salvage. Doctors told him, you need a minimum of four inches of small intestine to even be able to live a shortened life. Because if you don't have four inches of small intestine, your body is going to starve to death gradually because you cannot ingest uh, the needed nutrients and vitamins from, from the blood. So you need four inches. He said, I had less than four because it had been so destroyed. He said his weight dropped from 185 pounds to 126 pounds at that point. He said a man named Bruce Carson came, heard of it, uh, his problem came to the hospital in Wisconsin and he laid his hand on his forehead and he prayed and said, God, all of the prayers that people have been praying around the country for Bruce, I'm asking for a miracle. He said, when he laid his hand on me, he said, I felt something like electricity. And then he prayed and he said, I command his small intestine to grow supernaturally in the name of Jesus. Bruce Van Natta, the one receiving the prayer, he turned to his friend. He said, it feels like there's a snake inside. I can feel something moving inside. They took him in for another operation. And before the operation, the radiologists did a test where, aided by computer, they were going to measure his intestine. The first person did the test and had a very puzzled look on his face. Went and got the senior radiologist who repeated the same test. He said, I finally asked them, what's the problem? They said, clearly there's errors in your records and we have no idea how this uh, could have happened. After they did the test twice, they said, we don't understand, according to the charts, you should have less than four inches, but now you have more than 12 inches. He said, I started gaining weight right after he prayed for me. I gained back 40 pounds because my intestine being longer. He says, God is still in the business of doing miracles. I'm telling you, we serve a miracle working God. If you understood that in every area of your life, it, it is so common, isn't it? We, we say, I got faith for money. Ah, I can't believe that anybody can get saved. I believe that people can get saved, but I can't believe for healing. I believe for healing, but no, listen, we serve a miracle working God. And God wants to provide what you need, but he wants to give you dominion so that you are able to rule over the enemy. This is the truth of dominion rules. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes all across this place. Thank God. Now, while our heads are bowed, I'm giving a challenge. First of all, there are people that are here. You are not right with God. The very first miracle you need, I don't know if you need money. I don't know if you need help in your marriage. I don't know if you're sick in your body, but the very first miracle you need more than anything else, you need to turn from your sin. There are people here, if you're honest, you are not right with God. God would not be pleased with the way you're living. But I'm telling you, God can do a miracle 
from the inside out. I am not telling you, you just need to come to church. You can come to church every service, still wind up in hell. What you need is a miracle. Believe on Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and resurrection and believe that he can touch you and change you from the inside out. And there are people you've never done that, but tonight you can get right with God. You could pray and God could do a miracle inside of you. How many of you are not right with God? You need Jesus. Maybe you came tonight like I did, come in that concert in 1978 with no intention, I am not going to get saved. I'm not going to surrender. But while the Spirit of God was dealing with me, I said, you know what? I am tired of living with guilt. I am tired of the trouble that my sinful actions are bringing. And I lifted my hand and said, God, I want to get right with you. How many here, that's what you want? If you're not right with God and you want to get saved, lift your hand right now. I'm asking you to pray. I have nothing for you to buy. You don't have to sign up for a class. You need to pray. How many here, I'm not right with God. I know that. And I want to turn from my sin. God's dealing with you. Or you're backslidden. Lift up your hand right now. Backslider, God loves you. He can do a miracle inside of you. Lift your hand right now. All across this place, God's dealing with people. You can get right tonight. Thank God. Then I want you all to stand up. I'm going to open the altars. Some of you have areas of need. I want you to come. Tell God what it is you need. God is dealing with some of you. You're living in disobedience. You're not doing what God says. Then say, God, I want to change today. Others of you, God, what is it you want me to do? If there's something you want me to do, I am willing, but I need a miracle in my life. They're going to sing while people are coming right now. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain. 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 There is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. Jesus to break every chain break every chain to break every chain there is healing there is healing in the name of Jesus there is healing in the name of Jesus there is healing in the name Jesus to break every chain to break every chain to break every chain there is freedom there is freedom in the name of Jesus there is freedom in the name of Jesus there is freedom in the name Jesus to break every chain break every chain to break every chain there is power and there is power in the name of Jesus there is power in the name of Jesus there is power every chain break every chain break every chain Amen. let's praise God together right now God I thank you thank you Jesus for miracle power Lord God thank you for meeting with us Lord God the power of the Holy Ghost that is available right now 
in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to pray for several things. I want to pray first of all. Often when you hear a testimony, God will do something along that line. I talked about a man that his digestion was going to be uh, uh, impacted because of his uh, injury. I want to pray first of all you have any kind of digestive problem. I don't care whether that's irritable bowel, colitis, if you have an ulcer, if you have an allergy that you can't eat certain foods, but something you have difficulty in eating or digestion in any kind, even if it's not something I mentioned, stand up to your feet and lift up your hand. I want to pray for you where you're at. Amen. We're going to pray. Thank God. Numbers of people. That is not God's will. The Bible says he created everything to enjoy. Food is a gift from God. Amen. And I can tell you, when God healed me of an ulcer, what a glorious day it was. Chili pepper is straight from God. Amen. Thank God. I want you to put your hands on your body. If that's what you need, wherever it is, on your abdomen, your neck, I don't care where it is. We're going to pray right now. I'm going to pray for you. God, in the name of Jesus. I take dominion. God, you see what's wrong, and I rebuke it. God, heal their bodies, ulcers. God, allergies, aller allergies to foods. Celiac, God, right now, I reject it. Oh, God, irritable bowel, colitis, every kind of digestive problem, hiatal hernia. God, right now, I reject it in Jesus' name. There is going to be healing. There is going to be repair in their body right now. Healing virtue is going to touch. Pain will leave. Their body will function normally. Right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's give God praise right now for his goodness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, I'm grateful. Praise God. Now, every one of you that... Uh, you prayed. I know many of you that you're, you're going to have to eat something. This is the first time you have permission from God to eat something that's not good for you after church, and it's going to be okay. Amen. I want you, when I was prayed for, I had an ulcer, a very large and very painful ulcer. After prayer, I went and ate something hot. Normally, that would absolutely send me through the roof, but I believe God, if God said that I could be healed, that I'm going to be able to eat, and that was, uh, that would be 1987, and I've been able to eat whatever I want since then. So I want to encourage you, whatever it is, something you're allergic to, something that would normally cause pain, if you believe it, if you don't, then you don't have to do that, but I want to encourage you, believe God, and God is going to do a miracle in your body. How many of you were in pain when you first stood up? You, are, you were in pain before. Is there anybody here? I know some of you try to avoid pain. You don't want to eat it. Is there anybody you had pain before? Okay, then you're going to have to check it in that way. And I want to know. You got to let me know. You got to help a preacher out. If I pray for you, you got to tell me if you get healed. I get people like, you know, years later, oh, by the way, I was healed. Like, thank you. <laughs> I went home depressed, ready to sell insurance. You got healed. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Amen. So you do that. Amen. Thank God for you. I want to pray them. The other thing in this man's testimony, he had an accident. And this accident caused great problems in his body. How many of you, you have had any kind of accident? This was a car accident, work accident, maybe even a sports injury, something. It was an accident and it has left pain or limitation. You're not able to move in a certain way or you're in pain lift your hand up how many here I, I in an accident you need healing stand up stand up and lift up your hand we're going to pray for you i'm going to believe god that god's going to touch you amen i want you to put your hand on your body where the problem is if you can you got multiple put it on your head god will know where the pain is and he can fix it right now i'm going to pray for you right now in the name of jesus I take dominion over injury. I rebuke that injury. I speak life. Oh, God, vertebrae are going to be healed. The spine is going to be healed. God, knees are going to be healed right now. Elbows and shoulders, 
hips, God, ankles and feet. God, you're going to do miracles in hands and fingers. If where there is injury right now, I rebuke it. I speak healing power into their bodies. Pain is going to go. They're going to have free motion right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's give God a clap offering and thanks for healing power. God, I thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I want you to check yourself right now. If it hurt to lift, lift. If it hurt to bend, bend. If it hurt to squat, whatever it is, to, I want you to check it right now. I want to know what God did for you right now. You're checking it. Now, how many of you know the pain is gone or you have emotion now? Something changed. Dana, what happened? What was wrong before? Hips. Your hips, what was wrong? What'd you do? I had one replaced you had one replaced? And the arthritis in the other? And now what's happened? I can bend over a lot better. You can do it. Let me see it. <laughs> Praise God. Thank God. And lift up the one that, that was troubling you. Lift it up. How's that? Praise God. It was the bending over. Thank God. All right. Thank God for that. Amen. How many others? You already know. Know what happened. Head on collision, yep. And, uh, yep. Your neck has been getting worse since that accident, yeah. And what was hurting before? Motion? <laughs> to look to the side. Yep. And now move it. Let me see. <laughs> Praise God. Thank God for that. All right. Thank God. How many others? How many others? You already know that God touched you. Back there. Is that Richie? Yeah, what's up? They say you cracked the vertebrae from when the car fell off the jack. Yep. <laughs> wow. And, and then before what motion hurt you? Okay, bend. I want to move it. Bend it. Twist it. Now what's happened? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. Richie says he can dance. We'll pay money to see that. All right. Thank God. Anybody else? You already know that God's touched you. Somebody here, God's touched you. All right. The rest of you, keep checking.